Samuel chapter 2. We're going to look at Hannah's prayer tonight. This is following, obviously, the birth of Samuel and her dedication of Samuel to the Lord at the temple, as we looked at last Sunday night, that she had lent him to the Lord. And so tonight we'll look at her prayer of praise. And uh, really, most of, most of all the commentaries that I could find on this uh, we're talking about the prophetic nature of this prayer, and we'll certainly look at that a little bit tonight, but uh, practically there's three things that Hannah had some understanding of when she prayed this prayer and the Holy Spirit inspired these words that, that we need to take notice of. There's three understandings there, and what's amazing is that most of the, the cross-references we're going to look at are in Psalms, and David hadn't even lived yet. And so she understood this, well before his time. And so I think it's good for us to look at it tonight as a church. So 1 Samuel 2 verse 1, the Bible says this, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. There is, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly, let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And Elkanah went to, the, went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Let's pray and we'll get started tonight. Father, it's a, a good time to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you for the time you've given us to come apart and look at your word and try to get some help and some understanding about who you are tonight, Lord. Thank you for the, again for the time that we had during the witnessing class and the testimonies that were given forth of your saving grace and how you've worked in people's lives. Lord, it's such a, a wonderful blessing to hear that rehearsed in the ears of all that were there. And Lord, we thank you for that and just ask that as we look into your word now, Lord, that you'd work in our hearts, you'd prepare our hearts to receive it. We pray it would be effectual in our lives. We pray it'd help us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to serve you better in the days you give us on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, three understandings that Hannah had here, and we're going to look at them tonight. The first understanding is from verses 1 to 3, and that very simply is that the Lord is worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. Number two is, runs from verses 4 through 8, and that is that the Lord is just, meaning that he is equitable, he's proper, he's just, he's not biased, but he's just. And then the third understanding that we get is from verses 8 to 10, and that's that the Lord will execute judgment. And that is the prophetic part of that prayer. And we'll look at that in detail. But number one, we'll look at the fact that the Lord is worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. And many of you are looking at me and saying, Pastor, we know that. And I understand that we understand that God is worthy of praise. He absolutely is. But my question to us tonight is, how often do we praise Him? He's worthy of it. But how often do we make a conscious effort to try to lift praise and glory and worship and adoration towards Him? It should be obvious, but how often do we do it? Hold your place there in 1 Samuel 2. Let's go over to Psalm. I told you we'd be, we'll be in Psalm quite a bit through this point. Psalm chapter 106 to start off. Psalm 106. We know the Lord is worthy of praise. We understand that. We spent... Almost two hours this afternoon praising his name for the salvation of people that are in this church and how he's worked in their life. And while that is a wonderful time, that really ought not be the only time that happens. And so we'll look at this. Psalm 106, verse 1, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he 
is good. Brother Jim said this morning, God is good all the time. Let's not let that be just a, a blasé statement around here. Let's, let's mean that. And let's not let that be just something that we say every now and then. May we always have that hard attitude. God is good. He's very good to us. He really takes care of us, and, and we take it for granted. He's so faithful to us every day. You know, the sun comes up, and the sun goes down, and I think everybody in here probably eats at least three meals a day of whatever we want to eat, whatever we choose to eat. We've all got very nice clothes on tonight. We all have very decent vehicles in the parking lot. God's been good to us, folks. He's taking care of us. And because he's done that, he's worthy of some praise. He's good. It says, for his mercy endureth forever. Boy, some of these testimonies. God was patient with some people, wasn't he? <laughs> he's, you know what? He's been patient with me. He's been so patient with me in things. His mercy has endured. If I was in his place, I'd have vaporized me about four times before now. Get this guy off the face of the earth. His mercy endureth forever. He's worthy of praise for that. Verse 2, it says, Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? You know, we see some, some of the creation that, that he's made, and, and we see the things that he does in our life. But really, who can utter the full realm of what the Lord does? Paul said if books were written that could contain what Jesus Christ has done, the earth would be filled with them. So they couldn't contain them. He's worthy of praise. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? And who can show forth all his praise? We can't praise him enough. There, if, we, if we praised him from the time we woke up, to the time we went to sleep, every day of our life, that wouldn't be enough. He's worth more than that. Who can show forth all his praise? Say, so why should I praise him? Because he's worthy of it. He deserves it. He's good. His mercy endureth forever. So there we see who can show forth all of his praise. Turn over to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. I'm not going to read too many verses as we go through here because there's a lot of repetition, but Psalm 111, 112, and 113, they all begin the same way. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Verse 11 says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great. Sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's worthy to be praised because he's gracious and full of compassion. Because he loved me when I was a sinner. He loved you when you were a sinner. And God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died. We ought not make light of that. Psalm 113, the Bible says this, Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. But you know, we don't do that. We don't praise Him as we ought to. Verse 3, or verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Why should we praise him? Because he's, he's bigger and better than anything this world has to offer. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Why should we praise him? Because he's a God above all gods. He's a savior above all saviors. Verse 6, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. Well, that's a thought, isn't it? That God has to humble himself to be able to know what's going on down here he is so high and so lofty that he has to humble himself it's a humbling and it's a voluntary humbling to look and see what's going on down here he's worthy to be praised he raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes even with the princes of his people does that sound familiar that's out of verse 10 chapter 2 in first samuel we just read Verse 9, he maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Now, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump over to Psalm 117. We'll read the entire chapter, if you will, just bear with me. I know it'll be quite tedious to get through that chapter, but we'll go ahead and read it. 
Some of you are laughing because you've already looked, so you know what I'm talking about. Psalm 117, Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. For His merciful kindness is great toward us. Well, wouldn't you agree with that tonight? His merciful kindness has been great toward me. Praise His name for it. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Now that is not an exhaustive study by any means. But here's some things that we can glean out of that of why we need to praise the Lord because of His works, because of His name, because of His merciful kindness, because of the truth of His word, because of His goodness, and because of His mercy. Praise ye the Lord. He's worthy of some praise, folks. We ought to praise Him. Turn over to Psalm 147. Say, well, how do I do that? Well, you can say it with your mouth. It's obviously a, a great way to start. The Bible says, and uh, I believe it's in 1 Peter, talks about the sacrifice of praise given thanksgiving. And so, certainly that sacrifice of praise and, and with our lips and our mouth giving thanks to Him and praise to Him. But here's another way, and we've done quite a bit of this tonight. Psalm 147, verse 1, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is comely. You know, if we were to sing praises of the Lord, the Bible says that that's pleasant in his ears. That puts a smile on his face. As we were singing through, and I, I didn't bring it up here, but do you know how many hymns are in that great hymn book, that great hymn of faith book tonight? 538 hymns. Surely we could find one of them and memorize it and sing it unto the Lord every day and mean it from our heart. When we sit here and sing these verses and these songs, I hope it's not just a, a method that we're going through or a, an action that we're going through, but really and truly that we're holding that and we're singing those words to our Savior in adoration and praise to Him because He's worthy of that. And if we'll do that, the Bible says it pleases Him and puts a smile on His face. He's worthy of it. He's so worthy of it. So back in 1 Samuel, we see that Hannah's first three stanzas there of her prayer, if you will, it says, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more exceedingly proudly, let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. What is praise? Just recognizing who the Lord is. You know that model prayer that the disciples came to the Lord and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, okay, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven. What is that doing? That's recognizing the place of God the Father. Hallowed be thy name. That's a praise. That's an adoration. And so when the, when the disciples were taught by Jesus to pray, the first thing they did was praise his name. It would do us good to model our prayers after that. And when we lay down on our face or where we bow on our knees before the Lord and we go into enter into prayer, a time, a time of prayer with Him, it ought not just be, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Help, 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 help. Although that's okay to pray, but there needs to be a time of praise. Lord, You're worthy. I, <laughs> Lord, I'm nothing. I thank You for saving me. Thank You for making me something. But without You, I'm nothing. That time of praise it gets our heart in tune, gets us in the place where we need to be. Because if we just come before Him with, Lord, I need, I need, I need, please help, please help, please help. Although He's probably willing to do that, wouldn't you like to put a smile on His face before you start asking for a bunch of stuff? Somebody came to you, and if I came to Brother Adam and I said, Brother Adam, I need, I need $50. And every day of the week I came to Brother Adam, I need $50, I need $50, I need $50. And he gave it to me every time. And I never once thanked him for it. What do you think his attitude is going to be towards me? Brother Adam, I need $50. I need $50. What if I come to Brother Adam and say, Brother Adam, listen. I know that $50 was a sacrifice. And Brother, I appreciate you willing that to me. Willing that to me. And, and this is what I went for. And this is what I used it for. Really appreciate it. It was a big help. But you know, I need it again. He's probably going to be a whole lot more likely to lend it to me. And when we come to our Heavenly Father, it ought not just be, Lord, give, 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 help, 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 although He's willing to do that. There needs to be some time spent praising His name before we get into anything. Because He's worthy of that. He's absolutely worthy of that. So we see there in, in 1 Samuel 2, now, Hannah is praying this prayer on the heels of getting a son that she desperately wanted. 
She's praying this on the heels of being able to dedicate him unto the Lord. She's praying, in, praying this on the heels of some great blessings. And rightly so, when the Lord blesses us, we ought to praise his name for it. But I wonder tonight, would we, would we be willing to praise him in the hard times? Would we be willing to praise him when things are not going our way? Because I think that's what shows our true heart to our Savior. Things start going downhill fast and all of a sudden a sickness and all of a sudden this happens and a financial loss and a physical problem. And so many times we're apt to just look at the Lord and say, Lord, why? Why is this happening to me? And yet I think if we would spend time when those things start pouring on and the, the, the problems start coming, if we would just start praising the Lord, it would help our heart. It may not make the problems go away, but I guarantee it will help your heart. You say, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what you're going through. But I know what I've been through in my life. And I did that. I, there's one instance. Something negative happened. Very negative happened. And I just said, you know what, Lord? I could get mad at you, but I'm just going to praise your name. And I'm telling you, there was a, a load lifted. There was a burden lifted. And it was just like, Lord, whatever you want, that's fine. I'm going to praise your name because you are worthy. And that's the bottom line. He is worthy of our praise. You know, Job, when everything happened to Job in his life, lost all of that, lost all of his children, all of his goods, all of his possessions. And he said what? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was willing to praise God in the, in the face of serious adversity. His heart was still true with his, his Lord. And may our heart be that way. So number one, we see the Lord is worthy of praise. There in Hannah's prayer, the first three verses show us there's a, an understanding he's worthy of praise. The second understanding we get is that the Lord is just. He's just, and that's in verses, uh, we'll pick up three through eight, we'll read those. The Bible says, talk no more exceedingly proud. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God, a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed, and when he judges, he is a just judge. Verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that are stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. You know, if you look at those verses, what you start to see is that there's an equalization there. The Lord is just. He's equitable. He's proper. And if you look there in verse 4, it says, the bows of the mighty are what? They're broken. What does that mean? That means the Lord's hand took someone that was very mighty and he broke them. There was an equalization there. The rest of verse 4, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. He takes those that are stumbling along and he's able to gird them with strength that they may stand and walk strong and stand strong. The Lord is a, is a great equalizer. He is just. Turn over to Proverbs 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Hold your place there in 1 Samuel. Proverbs 11 things that Hannah understood, and we see these in her prayer. And as I mentioned, the whole prayer is prophetic in nature. One day, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. One day, everybody's going to praise him. They may not want to do it right now, but they're going to do it one day. You can, you can mark that one down. It's going to happen. Number two, we see the Lord is just. Proverbs 11, verse 1, the Bible says this, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Go over to uh, 16, so, uh, Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 11, in the same light, Proverbs 16, 11, the Bible says this, A just weight and balance are the Lord's, and all the weights of the bag are his work. The Lord wants things to be balanced. He wants things to be just. And so we see there in 1 Samuel 2, verse 4, there's an equalization of those things. Let's keep looking. Verse 5, it says, They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. Those that were, one day they woke up and they had no need of anything. And then with the Lord's hand, they're out working just for bread. Not for money, but just for bread. It says, They that were hungry have ceased. 
those that were poor and beggarly with the Lord's hand, He can make them full. He can make them satisfied. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. And boy, that's the case in Hannah's life, wasn't it? When Elkanah's other wife was bearing all those children to him, and here she sat barren. And then the tables flipped. And all of a sudden, this other wife, she's not bearing anything, and Hannah bears six. It's the Lord's hand that did that. The Lord make it, Lord made it equitable. In, uh, in verse 6, the Bible says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He's got the power to take your life, and he's got the power to resurrect you. Whatever he wants to do. You say, well, I don't think that's fair. We're going to see that in a minute. Who are you to question God? The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. You say, well, I don't have all the money in the world. God knows that. (laughs) You probably couldn't handle it. Those that are very well off, praise God for it. Apparently you can handle it. Because he's not going to give you something you can't handle. But we see that his hand can make you poor and make you rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. In verse 8, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust. And lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Now that's a little bit into the next point and we won't get into that just yet. But let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Grab Matthew 5 and Romans 9. Matthew 5 and Romans 9. Do a little Bible exercise here. You see the Lord is very equitable. He's very just in his dealings. And even though we may not agree with that, we really have no right to question it. In Matthew chapter 5, we'll just see a New Testament example of his justness. Matthew 5, verse 43, the Bible says this. Matthew 5, 43, Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Look what your Father in heaven does. For he maketh his Son, his Son, not just the Son, but his, S-U-N. He created it. It's his. He makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, uh, what do you more than others also, you know, not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, there's people today that would look at God and look at what happens in this world and they would say, there's no way there's a God. And if there is a God, why would He let that happen? They don't understand that He's perfect. See, our, our human finite minds, we don't have that capability to understand God's workings and God's dealings. But here we see in Verse 44, or verse 45, it says that the Lord makes the sun rise on the just and the unjust. He's good. His mercy endureth forever. He makes it rain on the just and on the unjust. He's good. His mercy mercy endureth forever. Over in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 verse, start reading in verse 9. Romans 9 verse 9. The Bible says this, For this is the word of promise, At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now we know that God chose Abraham to be the father of the the seed of Israel. I bet there were some people in that day, if Abraham told them, God's chosen me, he's going to make a nation out of me, they said, who do you think you are? What, What makes you think you're so special? But yet God chose Abraham. Why did he choose Abraham? I don't know. That's not up to me to decide. Not up to me to question. I have no, no dog in the fight. But here it says, At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also, that's Isaac's wife, also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any, now look what the Bible says, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. You understand that went against every law that every human being had ever made by that time. It was not proper for the elder to serve the younger. The firstborn got all the privileges. But that's not the case with Esau and Jacob. We know it's not. And the Bible here says that God chose Jacob over Esau. He said, Jacob have I loved? 
Esau have I hated. Well, why did God do that? I don't know. It's not up to me to question that. That's his doing. That's his working. Keep reading. It says, uh, verse 13, as it, written, as it is written, Jacob, I love Esau, I hated. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Question mark. People today would say, absolutely. Why does God let little babies die? Why doesn't God just stop all this war? Look, he's not unrighteous. All that stuff is brought on by sin. Why are we questioning God? We have no right to question God in those matters. For he saith to Moses, verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. Now verse 17, this used to bother me for a long time. I'll be honest with you. As I read and studied my Bible, this bothered me. Verse 17, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You know why he raised Pharaoh up? So he could destroy him. You say, that's not fair. Who are you to question God? He raised up Pharaoh so he could show his name great. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. And you know, it used to bo- what used to bother me about that was, I'd always been taught God's a merciful God. And he is a merciful God. And you know, you read back there in Exodus, he gave Pharaoh three times to repent. Even though he raised him up to destroy him, he still gave him three chances. <laughs> He's a merciful God. So why did he do that? Not up to us. Verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? And folks, if we're not careful in our life, we'll look at things that go on in this world, and we'll sit there, and, we'll, and in our heart of hearts, we'll say, God, why are you letting that happen? God, I don't think that's right. Boy, I've heard that so many times. If there's really a God, why does he let babies die? It's not his choice. Sin entered the world and death by sin, right? Death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So look, it's not up to us to question God or reply against God. Verse 20 says, Shall the thing formed say to to him that hath formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. What's Paul saying through all this through inspiration of the Holy Ghost? He is writing this to Jews, and he's saying, God's going to send salvation to the Gentiles, and who are you to question it? They had no dog in the fight. They had rejected the Savior. And he's saying, God's sending salvation to the Gentiles, and don't you worry about it. You just go on with it. And the same needs to be true in our life. We need not question God. We need to just go along with what what he puts in front of us. Verse 25, as he saith also in Oseas Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of God. Of the living God. We'll stop reading right there. You know, there's, there's an instance right now, and you all need to pray for Brother Bear. Uh, just going through some trials in Las Vegas. Pray the Lord would work some things out, give him some wisdom. But I look at that situation, and let me just be very honest with you tonight, as your pastor. I look at that situation, I look at a man that I know is zealous to serve God. I know he wants to start a church. I know he wants to see people saved. I know he wants to be the avenue that God uses to totally transform the lives of those drug addicts and those homeless people on the streets of Las Vegas, just like God did in his life. That's his heart. That's his passion. That's his desire. And yet here he is, struggling to find work, can't hardly pay the bills, got a church with eight people in it. And I'm going to be honest with you, as his pastor, I look at God and I say, God, why? Why won't you just bless what he's doing? Why don't you just give him all these churches to support him so that he doesn't have to worry about a job? But really, that's not my place to question God on that. And as much as I'd love to see Brother Bear be able to do that and God supply every need that he has, I don't know the purpose for it. But God sure does. You know, Brother Rick Baker preached a message one time. 
I don't know if it was a Bible conference message. I don't know where I heard it. But he preached a message out of Romans chapter 16. Turn over there, Romans 16. It's always stuck with me. It'll never leave me. And it has helped me through some very tough times. Romans 16, verse 27. The Bible says this, Romans 16, 27, To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. The message that he preached, and at that time their church was going through some horrible trials, terrible trials. And he preached that message to God only wise. And I'm telling you folks, there were things going on in that church you can't explain. There is no explanation for it. And yet he sat there and he, was, he preached to God only wise. Why did this happen? To God only wise is your answer. Why did this happen, Lord? Why is this happening to my life and why am I going through this? To God only wise be glory. What's our response when things happen that are negative? To God only wise be glory. What's our response to things that happen to us when we have no clue why they're happening? To God only wise be glory. Because he's worthy of it. He's worthy of that praise. We don't need an explanation from God. We're just to praise his name. To God only wise be glory. And deal with the situation. That's where we need to live. That's where we need to be. And that's what Hannah understood. That's what Hannah understood. Now, if you will, turn back to uh, 1 Samuel. We see that the Lord is just in his dealings with men in the, in the physical realm. Okay? But he's also de- just in dealing with men in the spiritual realm and concerning salvation there in verse uh, 8 of, of chapter 2. It says, He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. Now, those little phrases right there, to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory, that is a foreshadowing and a picture of our salvation here in the New Testament. Because Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 tells us that when we're born again, we are, become, we are made princes, that we are made priests, and that we are made kings. I'm sorry, we're made, we're made priests and we're made kings forever with Jesus Christ. Turn over to Revelation 1. I see the looks. Revelation 1. Let's just read it. Revelation 1. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What did he do? He took, he took me out of the dung hill, and made me a king. <laughs> Boy, that's something else. He took you out of the dung hill and made you sit with princes and made us sit with kings. What a blessed salvation. There to, the, in verse 8 also it says, and made them inherit the throne of glory. Now Romans 8, Galatians 3, and Titus 3 all says that we, have, we are heirs together with Jesus Christ. We have an inheritance in him in glory. When we got saved, what did he do? He pulled us out of the dung hill and he gave us an eternal inheritance. Made us heirs together through Jesus Christ. And so we see that this is also concerning salvation. The Bible says, whosoever, whosoever will, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord is just concerning men's salvation. Right now in this dispensation that we live in right now today, God's not willing that any should perish. Salvation is a free gift open to any and all that will receive it. He's just. You say, well, I don't think that person deserves to be saved. You didn't either. I don't think that person deserves to have full pardon of sin. You don't either. Neither do I. You say, what's the illustration? I think I've told this illustration here before, but at the fair I was talking to a man that worked at the Keene Mountain Correctional Facility. If I didn't tell it here, I told it in the, in the witnessing class. And he came by, and we had the three doors up, and I, I went ahead and I asked him, and he said, he said, yeah, go ahead and give me your presentation, but I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm not a believer. I said, okay, fine. So we went through it, and I asked him, I said, uh, I said, has there been a time you've been saved? He said, oh, yeah, I used to go to church. I said, really? I said, well, what do you do for a living? And he told me he worked at the, Ke- or he still works at the Keene Mountain Correctional Facility. And I told him about salvation. I said, you know, the Lord desires every man to be saved. And he said, yeah, let me tell you about that. I said, I've worked there for 15 years. He said, I've seen chaplains come in and preach to those guys and tell them that God will forgive them of their sins 
if they'll repent and ask him. I said, yes, sir, you're right. He said, I don't want a God like that. And it floored me. I said, why don't you want a God like that? He said, look, he said, I'm a good guy. He said, I've been married for 20 years. He said, I got two teenage boys. I love my wife. I've never cheated on her. I pay my bills. I pay my taxes just down the line. All these good morals. And he said, I've seen guys that come in there that have molested little children. They've done all sorts of unspeakable things. And he said, if there's a God that will forgive them, I don't want to be on his team. That's exactly what he said. You know what that man's problem was? He didn't say he was a sinner. He didn't realize that he doesn't deserve salvation. Even though he's lived a good moral life, he doesn't deserve it. But yet he thinks, because I've lived a moral life, and I haven't done these sins, that I'm good enough. But that's not the case. We know the Lord is just in his dealings with men concerning salvation. It's whosoever will. We're all under sin. All are sinners that come short of the glory of God. And so it's not a, a select salvation, but it's a salvation that's open to any. So back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We'll see the third thing here. You know, before we really hit that third thing, Hannah, you know, it was her desire to have a child. And she prayed and she vowed a vow and she fasted and she wept. But by doing all that, she really didn't deserve a child. It was just up to God's good pleasure to bless her. It was in his good blessing, in his good, excuse me, his good mercy to bless her. Just because we come to God and beg God and vow and fast and all this stuff, it doesn't mean God's beholden to bless us, answer that prayer. If he does bless that prayer and he does answer that prayer, it's only by his mercy. It's only by his goodness, and he's deserved prayer, praise for that. Just because we come to him crying our eyes out and bawling, it doesn't mean he's beholden to do anything for us. But because of his mercy and his grace and his goodness and his kindness and his long-suffering, many times he answers those prayers. And we need to be very thankful for that. So number three, number one, we saw that uh, there's an understanding that the Lord is worthy of praise. Number two, he's, he's just in his dealings with men, both physically and spiritually. And number three, that the Lord will execute judgment. There in verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 2, the Bible says, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, unto his king, that's Jesus Christ, and shall exalt the horn of his anointed again that's jesus christ so many people you know today we're going to start knocking on doors probably after the first of the year and you're going to come up and you're going to knock on the door and somebody's going to say i'm not saved but i don't think god's right to put anybody in hell you're going to hear that well if god's so loving why would he put anybody in hell why would he send anybody to that awful place i don't even think it exists it's exactly what they'll tell you but once you to understand god will execute judgment one day it's coming. And not only for the saved, but for the lost. Not only for the man that's born again, but for the, un, the unborn again, or the man that's, that's still lost in his sin. If you will, turn over to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. This is the, the fulfillment of this prophecy as it will come to pass in the future we know. Revelation 19. This prophetic prayer of Hannah concerning the second advent of the Lord. Revelation 19 verse 11. The Bible says this. And I saw heaven opened. And behold a white horse. And he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Judgment's coming. God's going to execute judgment. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And we obviously know this is Jesus Christ coming back to this earth during the second advent. And the armies which were in heaven, verse 14, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Those are the saints. That'll be you and I, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth upon the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourself together into the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Those folks that say, I don't believe God will do that, they haven't read Revelation 19. There's a judgment coming. God's going to execute judgment. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which with he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That is a literal place called hell. Literal fire, literal brimstone burning. God will execute judgment one day. And the remnant, verse 21, were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, uh, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So here you have Jesus Christ's second advent touching down the Mount, Mount Zion, or Mount Olives. And he's there, and we had the battle of Armageddon, and now we have the fulfillment and the setup of the thousand-year millennial reign. Verse 3. And cast into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, now we're at the end of the millennial reign. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, shall go about to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Here's another battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up uh, up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. A literal place. Judgment's coming. Where the beast and false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So why would you read all that? Because there's people today that say God's not going to execute judgment. And folks, when he does, it's final. It's over. But when he executes judgment, he's just in doing so. He's given men space to repent. So I don't think God would put anybody in hell. You haven't read your Bible. You don't know my Lord. You don't know my God. And so the third thing that Hannah understood is the Lord was going to execute judgment one day. And we know that in Hebrews 9, 27, the Bible says it's appointed that the man wants to die and after this, the judgment. Not only is the, the unsaved or the sinner going to be judged, but the saints will be judged too. Romans 14, 10 says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so that prophetic prayer, it covers both of those future judgments. And so we see that the three understandings that Hannah had, the Lord deserves our praise. Number one, Number two, the Lord's just in his dealings with men physically and spiritually. And number three, the Lord's going to execute judgment one day. And she understood all that through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost before most of those scriptures were ever written. I think it would do us good to take heed to them tonight. Let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.